Good morning. Good morning. Welcome this morning. My name is uh, Matt Trumbull. If you don't know who I am, I'm one of the elders here at Big Woods. And uh, thank you. <clears throat> I assume that was my wife. No. All right. Thank you, fan. All right. I am. I'm encouraged already. I do appreciate uh, those of you who have been praying for me this week. It is uh, desperately needed. The study of God's word is a is a serious thing, and uh, one that, in all honesty, in and of myself, I am not adequate to the task, uh, but God certainly is. Uh, he can use vessels even like me uh, to spread his word, to share uh, his good news, his gospel truth. And thank you, Scott, for leading uh, this week. I appreciate that. Uh, thank you, worship team, uh, for leading us in worship. And, and he sang a lot of songs that... Um, it's sung of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the love that he has for us. And really, by the end of this sermon, I, I pray that you understand just a little bit better um, that gospel truth, that you understand a little bit better the love that God has for you and our response um, to that. I want to thank Aaron for a great intro last week. Uh, when he was done preaching, I was like, yeah, I'm ready to go. I wanted to kind of go right then and there, even though I wasn't quite ready um, last week, but it was, a, it was exciting. I'm wondering how we did with the challenge that he laid before us in reading Colossians um, at least once this week. I got through it. I did focus in on one little section, maybe a little bit more than the others, but uh, what an incredible book. And how we did when, when we, we, we diligently prayed for one another and for this church. And... Uh, I want to encourage us to continue with that, and I'll honestly challenge you with that once again um, this week. It has been a while since I have preached in front of you, never in this. This is slightly intimidating, being up here. I, uh, I have my notes. I'm good. I have my Bible. I have added a set of reading glasses that I may since the last time I preached, but, but God is good, and, uh, and again, I pray that he will use me. Uh, this morning. Let me, let me pray. Father God, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. God, that you give us that we can um, know and understand who you are a little bit better each time we read it. God, we can understand a little bit better uh, who we were before Christ, but God, that you can understand a little bit better just how amazing your love is and that you have transformed us through the gospel of Jesus Christ. I pray that we understand that this day. Would you use me uh, as you will uh, for your glory and for your glory alone? Help us to understand this scripture, uh, God, and uh, again, that we would go out of here changed um, and more in love with who you are. Uh, we praise you and we thank you that we can come before you in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. I uh, struggled for all of three minutes on what to title this sermon. And uh, I couldn't come up with one, so here it is, Colossians 1, 1 through 8. So let's, uh, let's get to the scripture and read. Colossians 1. It says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all of the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of this you uh, have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you. And indeed, in the whole world, it is bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you, since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. Just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, he is a faithful minister in Christ on your behalf, and he has made known to us your love in the Spirit. Colossians 1, 1 through 8. To be honest with you, I was a little bit late, maybe last, uh, well not quite last I guess because there was one other option, um, in signing up, and it was this week or next week, and I'm away next week, so this week it was. And I thought, oh, great, with, with the, all the amazing, incredible things that are in Colossians, I get the greeting paragraph. 
But then I read. Did you notice all of the words in there? I mean, we've got faith and hope and love and gospel and truth, etc., etc., etc. A huge percentage of these words would be found in a concordance or a Bible dictionary. It is, it is filled with our, our Christian talk, if you will. And so in honesty, I was very tempted. Let's do an academic study, because that's really kind of who I am. And, and let's look at each of these words and see what Scripture says about each of those words. And let's study and let's understand. But in reality, I think I would have been missing the point of this section of scripture. You see, the purpose of this is a report. It's a reflection on a report that Paul has heard at the church at Colossae. And this church is doing some things right. And really then, as, as, as thinking of a sermon, it begs the question, how are we doing when we compare ourselves to the right things the church at Colossae is doing? The primary outward evidence I see in this report is love. It's mentioned twice uh, in here. Paul has heard of their love for the saints in verse 4. And Epaphras has reported on their love in the spirit in verse 8. And Paul's heard of this report. He's, he's heard some information. And so this love must be visual. It must be measurable. It must have evidence that they are loving one another. And so, of course, I question, what does, what's this love look like among the church at Colossae? Well, we get great instruction from a very famous segment of scripture. Interestingly enough, this, this scripture is often read at weddings and associated with marriage. And this is right because I think the person we should love best here on earth uh, is our spouse. However, the purpose originally of this scripture was it was written for Christians and brothers and sisters and how they should love each other in the church. And of course, that would be 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8, where it says love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. I love the NIV. It says it keeps no record of wrongs. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. And so here we have a a list of measurable things. I like that. A concrete explanation of what love is. And so church, how are we doing at loving one another? To be honest, in in my experience, pretty good. This worship team that was up here, they, they bear with me weekly. My moods. The fact that I can't really arrange music and they say, hey, Matt, what do we need to do? And I'm like, oh, whatever the spirit leads you to do. I mean, that's kind of our plan up here um, when we play. But, you know, they, they bear with that. Um, the fact that things don't work sometimes on Thursdays and, as you know, sometimes on Sundays. And yet they still come back week in and week out and minister with me. I remember when we, when we moved from our old house to where we live now. And uh, I piled every non-piece of furniture that needed to move in our living room, which was pretty big. And I remember my dad coming in to that morning, and he was going to you know, help us move. And, and I could just hear the air deflate out of him. <sighs> this is going to take forever, because it was massive. But then a caravan came from Big Woods. Brothers and sisters in the Lord with happy faces willing to give up a Saturday to help me and my family. And and there was so many of them that we were done way before lunch. A gigantic testimony of love, not only to me and my family, but to my dad as well. I remember a few years ago, Angeline had emergency surgery. 
and in her recovery, the care and concern that was expressed and acted on from this church to her and to me was incredible, was amazing. And that constant stream of meals that kept coming from homemade tortilla soup to pizzas. I remember many times coming home from vacation to a perfectly cut lawn with diagonal lines even. There are countless examples of this church coming alongside, bearing with and bearing up, patiently teaching, humbly chastising, crying with or rejoicing with even just me. And Bill Stankowitz last week got up here and, and praised God for the love that this church has expressed. I trust, I hope that this has been your experience here as well. Amen. And so I thought, wow, good. I can just sit down. I'm done. But then I changed the question. Changed it from how are we doing to how am I doing? And you might ask yourself, how are you doing at loving the brothers and sisters in Christ? And I think when one of those worship team members cancels last minute, how patient am I? When, when somebody requests a good song, but one that I don't like, or I'm going to really struggle to figure out how the band can play, how much do I insist on my own way? How resentful am I when I have to give up a Saturday to serve someone else? When I've got plenty of my own things to do. How often am I rude or unkind or quite frankly selfish? And so I don't know about you, when I look at it this way, I, this way, I, I see I have lots of room for improvement. That I don't love as well as I should. And even when I choose to do the right thing, my attitude in the background isn't always right. Maybe you can identify with me on that. And in all honesty, as I continue my thought process of what in the world I'm going to preach on, I thought, okay, good, I've got it. Let's attack those shortcomings. Let's preach on working on being more patient. Let's, work, let's preach on, on working on being kinder, more kind. My wife did fix that grammatical error, but I didn't. Let's work hard on loving one another. The problem with this is if we attack those things, we're attacking the symptoms of a bigger issue. Really, two thoughts came to mind with attacking symptoms. I don't know if you noticed, but a couple weeks ago, I was pretty sick when I was up here leading worship. And uh, I took medicine, and the medicine helped for a time. But when that Sudafed wore off, a sickness came right back. Because what does Sudafed do? It attacks the symptoms. It doesn't do anything for the actual root cause of what was making me feel bad. And I really want to attack the reasons why we may not be loving as we ought to. I also thought, have you ever, you ever felt this frustration with your Christian walk? You want to improve. You want to get better. You want to work really hard on your weaknesses. And you want to try not to sin in the same way over and over and over and over Again, and yet you fail, I fail again and again. It's like we're constantly running into a brick wall. I had a, a, a wonderful picture of this as I was typing this sermon, and there was a, a cardinal that was for hours slamming himself into my front picture window. I assume he was attacking his reflection, I don't know, but he was expending a whole lot of energy and accomplishing very little. And so I don't want to do that today. I really want to get to the root. So how can we love each other as we should? What is the root of why we do love each other the way we should? Or what is the root of why we don't love each other the way we should? I see two things in Colossians 1, 3 through 8, which is the focus of where I'm going today. First thing is we must have complete faith in the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay, because it is that gospel 
that enables us to love one another rightly. Two, we must also set our hope on heaven because that eternal perspective motivates us to love one another. And so, we must have complete faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you look, Paul states in verse 4 that he has heard of the Colossians' faith. He reminds them again in verse 5 that they have heard the word of truth, the gospel. And again in verse 6 that they have heard and understood the grace of God's truth. The enabling of their love for one another is surrounded by and saturated in the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And what is that good news? What is the gospel? What is the grace of God's truth? Well, here it is. We've all sinned. We've all done wrong things. We've all committed an offense against a holy God. And the penalty for that offense is death. It's physical death where our bodies die. But it's also spiritual death where we, where we are eternally separated from the holy God. But God is rich in mercy and love. And he provided a way out for us. Jesus Christ, God's son, left the glories of heaven. He came to earth as a baby and he lived a perfect life. And he took the penalty for your sin and my sin on the cross where he died a horrible, horrible death. Yet, he rose from the dead, triumphant over sin and death. So that now, for those who believe in him, there is no longer condemnation, but only the everlasting joy in the presence of a holy God. That is the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, what he has done for us. Where do you stand? What do you believe? What do you know? It says in verse 5 and 6, Paul states that the gospel has come to the Colossians. And like anywhere in the world, the gospel is believed. It bears fruit. And that fruit that is born here among the Colossians is love. It is faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ that enables us to love one another. We can't work really, really hard to stir up this kind of love. It can only come as a result of the good news, the truth, the gospel of Jesus. I'd like you to turn with me, please, to Ephesians 2. I'll put it up on the screen as well, but this is one worth having in front of you. Ephesians 2. And when you get there, I want you to, to, to listen to who we were before Christ and who he has made us through faith. Ephesians 2, 1 and 10. It says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. You were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. And get this, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love which, which he has loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. 
For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we might walk in them. Soak that in for a minute. Who we were and who we are because of Christ. Now my daughter, Julie, explained it this way. Suppose you were before a judge and you were declared guilty of a crime punishable by the death penalty. Now when it came time to sentencing and you were sentenced to death, the judge stepped in and he said, my son will take that penalty in your place. Would that ever happen? It happened in Christ. And and not only is his son going to take my place, we get to live an abundant life. What would your response be to that judge? Could you possibly be flippant and be like, hey, thanks for life, see ya, and walk out of that courtroom? I know I think... I would be indebted forever. I would want to live in gratitude for what that judge had done. And by the way, I wouldn't be living to earn the favor of the judge. The favor had already been granted. See, since we have been saved through faith by by God's grace, since we've been transformed from one who was under God's wrath to one who is seated with Christ, we now walk in good works. And among those good works is loving and loving the brothers and sisters in Christ. Let me put it this way, as I always always get Romans 12, 1 in when I preach. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, I appeal to you because of God's mercies to present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Because of the mercies of God's salvation, because of what he has done, we worship God by living sacrificial lives, lives that actively love one another. And this isn't a giant leap I'm making. This is all throughout scriptures. In Ephesians 5, it says, Therefore, Be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. In 1 John 4, 10 and 11, in this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he has loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. 1 Peter 1, 22 and 23, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart since you've been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. And quite simply, 1 John four nineteen, we love because he first loved us. So let me say it again. The good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel, enables us to love one another. It's an act of obedience, an act of worship to respond to the saving work of Jesus by actively loving others, by actively loving the saints. There is a warning in this, a caution that I must present, we must heed this morning. 1 John 4, 7 and 8. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. There's multiple scriptures out of 1 John that I could read that convey this same sentiment, this same thought, this same warning. So I want you to heed this warning this morning. If you come in here week in and week out, not actively loving, not loving the brothers and sisters that are here. If all you do is complain with how awful these people are here, if you offer no grace or no mercy to anyone, 
If you come here only to get what you need with no thought for others, if you don't have love for the saints, you've got to consider, you've got to question, where do you stand before God? Have you recognized that you're a sinner in need of God's grace, in need of the gospel? And I don't stand here to judge or to condemn. That's not my job. I'm concerned. I'm concerned that everyone here has confessed with their mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in their hearts that God raised them from the dead. And if you've not done that, today is the day of salvation. I invite you, please, please talk with me after the service. And the great thing is, is once we've accepted Christ as Lord and Savior of our lives, we are enabled and I think compelled to love each other. And encouragingly, this is evidence of the work of Christ in our lives. We can see it and build confidence in who we are in him. So we must have complete faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Secondly, we must rest our hope on heaven. See, I think an eternal perspective motivates us to love one another. We see here in Colossians 3, uh, verse 3. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. See, Paul has heard of their faith and love because of the hope that they have in heaven. And this hope is not the feeling kind of hope. This hope is the certainty of what is to come because of what Christ has done. This hope is the everlasting joy we get to experience uh, in the presence of a holy God forever. As well as the mansions with many rooms and the streets of gold and the fact that there's, there's no uh, crying, there's no sorrow. But I think most importantly, this hope is the presence in the glory of our God. And if you've been reading through Colossians, you know what I'm saying here is repeated multiple times over and over. And I'm trying to stay out of Colossians, but I can't for this one. Colossians 3, verse 1. If you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things that are of the earth. We must have an eternal perspective. You see, if, if all that we have to live for is right here and right now, then by all means we should fight and claw and kill to get what we want. We should eat, drink, and be merry. But we know that the reality is that our best life is not now. Our best life is the life to come. And thank God for that. I mean, while there's many fun and cool and encouraging and wonderful things on this world, the reality is we know this world is broken. The things are not right. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18 says, For this light and momentary affliction, and I love this, is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. And so we set our minds on the things that are eternal. We set our mind on God's word. We set our mind on the souls of mankind, the glories of heaven, the splendor and majesty of God himself. We set our minds on our future hope. Because we don't have to fight and claw our way to get what we want. Because we don't have to focus in on satisfying the desires of our flesh. Because we know that the things of this world pale greatly in comparison to the things of the next. Because we have a position in heaven as believers to focus in on. Because of that, we can actively love one another. You see, because I think... Being completely satisfied with the fact that I get to spend eternity in the presence of the creator God of the universe. That will cause me to be patient 
when that worship team member cancels last minute. The fact that I am longing to worship with all the saints that have ever been and all the saints that ever will be around the throne of God. See, that motivates me to sing with enthusiasm songs that other people have picked for the worship service, surrendering my desire to have my own way. Recognizing that I get a room in heaven, even though I definitely don't deserve it. It persuades me to enjoy a Saturday meeting someone else's needs even when I have lots of my own stuff to do. Do you hear what I'm saying? None of the sacrifices we have to make in order to actively love one another can compare one little bit to the glories of our future hope. Let me say that again. None, none of the sacrifices that we have to make in order to actively love one another can compare one little bit to the glories Of our future hope. It says in 1 Corinthians 2 9, but as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. Do you hear that? No eye has seen, no ear has heard, our hearts haven't even imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. We must. Rest our hope on heaven. We must rest our hope on the eternal and not the transient. So what can we do? How do we... How do we love the gospel more? How do we... How do we set our mind on things above? There is a saying... That he's so heavenly minded, he's no earthly good. Perhaps you've heard that. Well, I think this is, this is a legitimate criticism. If your excuse for not helping a brother in need, for not counseling a sister in distress, if your excuse for not investing in another believer's life is because every week you block off every weekday evening, and all day Saturday to read your Bible and pray. I'm guessing that's not our issue. So how do we love the gospel more? How do we set our mind on things above? Scriptures say, now faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I've got some simple things. I'm not a rocket scientist. I teach high school math. It is, conceptually, this is simple. What do we need to do? You need to read your Bible. You need to read your Bible consistently and constantly and intently. And any other L-Y word, okay, that really focuses in on the scriptures. We need to study who God is. Not just read, study who God is. We need to recognize through the scriptures who we were and who we are because of the gospel. That's going to make us love the gospel more and more. It's going to increase our faith. We need to make notes on what God has for us now and what God has for us in the future. And we need to set our mind on these things. We need to fill our heads with these things. We need to understand How God calls us to worship him with our sacrificial lives as we respond to what he has done for us through the work of Jesus Christ. We need to read. We need to read. We need to read. We need to pray. And as you pray, yes, we have needs in this world. I want to encourage you to step away from fully Focusing in on that. I want you to pray that God would reveal himself to you as you read his word. I want you to pray for brothers and sisters in the church, not just for the needs. Yes, we need to pray for those things. We are needy people. But you would pray that God would reveal himself to others in this church as they read and study his word. 
Would you pray that God would show and empower you on how to build up his church? Would you pray that you would love the gospel more and more each day? And would you pray that you're empowered, that you can, that you're able to focus in on what is eternal and stop spending so much energy and effort on what is temporary. So I encourage you, read, read the scriptures, intently read the scriptures, pray with passion, pray for one another, and finally serve. Join a home group, work in a ministry, be looking, be available, be open to meeting other people's needs. Now, why do I say this? Because I think this gives opportunity for you to put into practice what God is revealing to you through his word and as you pray to him. It gives you opportunity to respond to our loving God by loving others and loving his people. And that's my challenge. Read. Read the scripture. Pray. Pray with passion. Serve. Serve one another. Would you pray with me? Father God, thank you once again for your word. God, thank you for how uh, you challenge us in it. God, I thank you for the successes when we can see when you are working. God, I thank you for the blessing of the brothers and sisters here in this church who have in so many ways been actively loving towards me. God, I pray that I would do the same. God, that I would love you more than I love things. God, that I would look forward to your heaven more than I look forward to, to doing this or getting that here on earth. God, in all things that we do, may we submit to you and your will. May we love you more and more. And God, as we go out, God, let us be a light to this world, spreading that hope that we have within us and demonstrating that love even as we love one another. And so all things, you receive glory. And I thank you that I can come before you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.